from the Cloudy Copenhagen, and welcome to the webinar Energy Efficiency in Municipality Buildings, hosted by Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency. My name is Begonia, and I'm working as a research assistant at the Copenhagen Center, and I will be the moderator of today's webinar. A couple of things before we move to the main content of our webinar. This webinar is going to be about 30 to 45 minutes long, including time for Q&A at the end. In case you cannot stay until the end or want to get back to our presentations, all the materials and recording of the whole webinar will be available online in a few days on the Copenhagen Center's Knowledge Management System. And we have many other webinars and other information there. Have a look. I will give you more information in a few minutes. Before we start discussing about today's webinar, I would like to inform our attendees that we comply with the General Data Protection Act, also known as GDPR. This means that your personal data, such as name, email, workplace, is safely processed and stored, and all of your rights pursuant to the GDPR are respected. You have full access to the data being processed about you, and at any time, you can request that inaccurate data be deleted or rectified. For access or further information, please contact with the people that are presenting here. A few things about the Copenhagen Center. The center conducts research and advisory activities in the field of energy efficiency and serves as an energy efficiency hub for the sustainable energy for all initiative. The center has an established network of global, regional and national partners with a broad range of stakeholders to help accelerate the implementation of energy efficiency activities. On a regular basis, the Copenhagen Center is conducting webinars. All materials, including recordings and presentations from previous webinars, can be found on Copenhagen Center's Knowledge Management System under the e-learning section. The material of today's webinar will be uploaded shortly, but until then, you can check one of the recommended webinars that are related to today's topic. Finally, I would like to inform that you can send us your questions during the presentation, and we will do our best to answer as many as we can at the end. And now I would like to give the floor to our panelist, Clara Camarasa. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the webinar, Energy Efficiency in Municipal Buildings, promoted by the Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency, C2E2, a C4 All Energy Efficiency Hub within the UNEP DT partnership in Copenhagen. A bit of context about myself, given that I will be guiding you through the content in this session. I'm a researcher and project manager with more than eight years of experience in the field of energy efficiency and decarbonization of the building sector. In the past five years, I've focused on generating national and international building stock data through a number of analytical frameworks, mostly quantitative frameworks needed to describe and hopefully accelerate the diffusion of energy efficiency technologies. It is a pleasure for me to guide you through today's session, and I hope you enjoy it. it you find the content useful. The objective of this session is to share insights on the relevance of energy efficiency improvements in municipal buildings, along with some of the key measures and pathways to implement such measures. We will start with a brief introduction into basic terms and concepts of energy efficiency measures, whether municipal buildings or not. These principles apply to all typologies or building types, municipal, residential, mixed use, and project types, whether new construction or renovation of ex existing buildings. This will take around five minutes. Once we have reviewed these fundamental concepts, we will move to the next block, which is the methodological framework to implement such measures in buildings, including steps and data required in the evaluation of energy efficiency in municipal buildings. This will take around 10 minutes. In the next block, I will share best case practices of energy efficiency measures implemented in municipal buildings in Canada, Ukraine, and Turkey. This will take around five minutes. And finally, as Begonia already mentioned, and it has been the case as it has been the case in other webinars, we will have around 15 minutes of questions and answers, an open session in which, as many of you already know, we will have you will have the opportunity uh, to raise some of the questions you will have through the content of this presentation. Starting with why we should implement energy efficiency measures in municipal buildings. As many of you already know, buildings and building construction sector combined are responsible for more than one third of the global final energy consumption, 
and nearly 40% of the total and indirect CO2 emissions. Furthermore, energy demand from buildings and building construction continues to rise, driven by a number of factors such as improved access to energy in developing countries, greater ownership and use of energy consumption devices, as well as growth of global building floor area. Out of this energy consumption, up to one third can come from public buildings, depending on the case. Municipalities around the world usually have a high degree of control over their buildings, such as city halls, government offices, hospitals, schools, libraries or museums, as well as any, any other public building. This authority grants them with a powerful opportunity to improve energy efficiency and reduce carbon emissions within municipal buildings. Moreover, this energy efficiency improvements can serve as a model for private buildings and inspire building owners to take action. It also provides with the experience to undertake such projects and the possibility to test its framework conditions, such as building codes, and see if these enable the development of such projects. In case they wouldn't, it's in their hands too to create a federal groundwork that these projects could develop in. Other reasons why energy efficiency measures should be implemented in municipal buildings are because these can achieve a reduction of energy consumption while maintaining or even increasing the comfort levels of the users of the facilities and their quality of the service. Energy efficiency improvements will also derive in direct and indirect reduction of greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. It can also reduce equipment operation and maintenance cost, extending their useful life. In many cases, and depending on the specific case and framework conditions, this might even be a way to adapt the equipment and facilities to current regulations. Energy efficiency measures can also ensure air pollution reduction and promote the use of renewable energies, such as PV panels. The various plans and works needed to construct the, uh, and upgrade the buildings can also lead to local job creation by the use of human resources to design, execute, and monitor these works. And last but not least, as we mentioned earlier, it is a way to lead by example. Such actions can even improve the image of municipalities by promoting awareness with the environmental and energy efficiency project process within their municipalities as well as acquire the necessary experience in such projects and test if the necessary framework conditions are there for these projects, as we mentioned earlier. Another thing I would like to highlight in this webinar is the depth of the energy efficiency measures that is needed if we want to achieve the carbon reduction target set on a national and international level. And the first concept that one must know regarding energy consumption in buildings and perhaps one of the most important ones is the net zero energy concept. And what this term means, well, this means that the energy needed in the building for the water supply, the heating, hot water, cooling, lighting, and electrical appliances divided by the building surface must be zero. In other words, the energy use intensity minus renewables must up to zero net energy. Should be noted, however, that the concrete definition and values to calculate this formula varies across countries and regions, even within EU member states. And why is it so important to reach this net zero energy? It is essential to understand the notion that buildings and their components work as a system, especially in terms of energy. One can think of the human body as an analogy. All of the organs need to work together for the system to work. A single, single element should not be approached, for example, windows, without taking the rest of the building elements into account, since otherwise we can create the so-called locking effect. What the locking effect means, and for this I would quote Dr. Inge Fogatz, is locking effects is acknowledging that most buildings that undergo a moderate efficient renovation are not likely to be renovated again for another 50 years given the financial strain on owners to recover the original renovation investment cost. In other words, you will not re-replace re the window in 10 years, even if you understand window specifications better than you do now. Your replacement windows have locked in a moderate level of efficiency for the long term, and that decision will result in 
80% more CO2 emissions than another net zero energy or passive house standards would have. There are many energy efficiency measures that can be undertaken, be it in a municipal and non-municipal building. A way to cluster these measures is through the types of systems they entail, passive systems, active systems, or other generic improvements. Passive systems are those that do not require energy to operate. Active systems are those that, although they're most more efficient than normal ones, they still require or rely on energy to function. Generic improvements do not respect to any particular technology, system, or building component, but can also improve the energy consumption of the building quantitatively. Usually, passive measures or generic improvements are implemented first and then continue with active systems. But in any case, as mentioned in the previous slides, all systems, including active systems, must be taken into consideration for an optimal result of the energy performance of the building. Starting with passive systems, as far as the building envelope is concerned, this can be include insulation of the building envelope that makes the thermal conditions inside the building stable, either from the cold exterior or heat conditions. Also efficient windows and doors are critical to ensure that the heat or cold does not escape through these openings. In the cases where the building is located in warmer weather conditions, envelope systems such as green roofs or facades, canopies, parasols, can minimize the soil, soil heat gain. And regardless of the temperature, it is important to capitalize in the daylight to save energy. This is achieved through the orientation of the building, also with solar shelves and mirror ducts, as we can see in the images to the bottom right of this slide. Moving into active systems, some examples are efficient lighting, efficient HVAC systems. This is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, heating controls or smart energy management. And when it comes to generic improvements, some examples are proper maintenance of the facilities, adapting the use schedule to capitalize daylight, good energy consumption practices among the employees or users of the building, an energy management plan, and quantification of savings and investments on end any energy efficient measure that is undertaken, among others. These are just a few examples, but we will see many more throughout this presentation. It should be noted that energy efficiency measures can be carried out both in pre-existing buildings through retrofit projects, as well as in new construction. In the case of newly constructed buildings, there might be a greater degree of freedom in the passive design system measures that can be carried out, and it is essential to introduce such measures during the design process to obtain optimal results at a lower cost. An example of this can be good orientation of the building to capitalize on sunlight or a green facade, for example, to protect against the incidence of sun, wind or rain and reduce the heat transmittance. On the other hand, in the case of pre-existing buildings, the measures must be adapted to the conditions marked by the previous typology of the building. Both cases are becoming more and more spread in the world, especially in public buildings, as we will see later on this webinar, since they set an example and because in most cases the investment is recovered in a very short period of time through savings in the energy bill. To support the municipalities to undertake energy efficiency measures in their municipal buildings, we present the following methodological framework, composed of nine main steps. The first step is to designate a person in charge or a working group for the energy management and improvement plan. This working group should include as part of their team an expert in energy audit of buildings, someone with technical background in the field, either architect or engineer. The second step is the collection of facility energy consumption data. The third step is the inventory of installed energy consumption equipment or current status of the building components, that is, for example, the facade or envelope. The next step is a survey on users' consumption habits, use timetables, temperature characteristics, lighting levels, etc. On this basis, the municipality can make an audit or evaluation of the energy consumption of the building based on an analysis of the data collected and measurements of the energy parameters. The sixth step is the definition of 
applicable energy improvements based, of course, on the above analysis. Once this information is available, the seventh step is to select the improvement measures according to the objectives defined by the municipality, be it economic savings, reduction of CO2 emissions, or any other parameters that have been set on a national, regional, or municipal level. Then the development of an action plan for the implementation of such measures, which should derive in the implementation of the measures, as well as the very thorough monitoring of the results and control on consumption. This should be done in parallel with the communication of a project, the awareness raising on energy efficiency measures, and if necessary, the revision of the framework condition to enable such projects, for example, through building codes. We understand that for steps seven, eight, and nine, no one better than the municipalities per se to know how to develop these plans within your own municipality or region, taking into account the concrete processes of internal organization and organizational charts. Therefore, in this session, we're going to focus more on the technical part, on steps one to six. Step one, designate a person in charge of a working group or energy management improvement plant, including energy audit expert. Some recommendations for this step, based on other case studies, is to set up a specialized team for energy performance optimization, preferably staff with this as their only responsibility, otherwise they might be overwhelmed with other duties. This means that, as mentioned, this group should include as part of the team at least one person expert in energy audit in buildings, someone with a technical background in the, in the field. This could be an architect or an engineer, as we mentioned earlier. Then decide from whom and when logging of the results will be performed. This should be approximately three days, no more than three days, actually. Allocate a well-defined budget with associated responsibilities within the team, formulate duties and authorizations, and inform citizenship and public servants about the energy efficiency plan. And what kind of data will you need to fill in to know the energy consumption of the building and the possible improvements to be carried out? Of course, some general information would be referred to reference the building, official name of the building, an ID or alias to name to refer to the building. In the study, the name of the municipality, address, a contact person, which should be the person appointed ideally in step one. Then general data on the building would be needed, such as type of building according to its program, which refers to is it a city hall, library, sports facility, school, or any other program. Useful surface is also important, which is the useful area of the building in square meters. The climatic zone to which it uh, belongs is a key fact to optimize the energy performance of the building. The year of construction, this might be approximate if it's not known. The building typology, if it's isolated or between walls, which we show in this figure, detached or attached. It is also important to know well, the use of the building, be it the number of users, the operation or use schedule, the hours of operation, the users per day, and again, this data can be approximate. The next step is to find out the energy consumption of the building per year. This is typically shown in kilowatt hour values per year. This information is extracted from the energy bill of the building. Also associated expenses normally without taxes. So in the case of Europe, for instance, it would be euros per year. The data should also be broken down into the different energy fuels present in the building, be it electricity, energy, natural gas, diesel, biomass, etc. Once you know the total energy consumption of the building per year, you can go to the next step, step three inventory of the energy consumer equipment, installed and state of the building components. To do this, we will start by getting to know the passive systems, specifically the building envelope. Firstly, the glazed openings are analyzed so we can add, you can know about the different types of openings, their carpentry, type of glass, percentage it represents of the total facade. Also, if there's any type of solar protection. Then the HVAC systems, the major classification is between central or decentralized 
local systems for the HVAC systems. Another information that should be collected is around the sanitary hot water systems, as well as the lighting and any smart energy monitoring and management systems, including, of course, any renewable energy generation systems. This should be also included in the, in the study. Now, the next step is step four, is a survey on the user's consumption habits. These are some questions that can be asked. And as you see, they require knowledge about the use of the building. So you will have to make sure that whoever is answering to these questions knows about these patterns, either because they've directly used or been working in the building or because they've asked and have the experience. First, general questions like, is an energy service company contract or is it expected to be contract? Do you have active policies for training and good practices in energy consumption? When it comes to hot water, at what temperature do you regulate the building hot water equipment? In terms of the heating and cooling, what months of the year do you use the heating and cooling on a regular basis? If you can regulate the temperature of the heating system or equipment, can you? At what temperature do you regulate it on a regular basis? And do you carry out regular maintenance of your heating and cooling system? In terms of the envelope, in summer, do you open one window with different orientation to keep the building cool? Do you open windows even when the heating or cooling is on? In terms of the lighting, do you have any lighting control device such as present detectors, timers, or light regulator? And finally, do you need to turn on the lights during the day? As a result of the collection of the data, the following step comes, step five, the evaluation of the building energy consumption can be carried out, leading to examples like the one we show in this slide of the public building in which the German Reichstag receives a certificate with excellent energy performance. Ideally, of course, that's what we should aim at. On the right side, you can see the result of, of this assessment for the building alongside, if it, uh, alongside its environmental impact rating in terms of CO2 emissions. After the building energy consumption assessment, the definition of improvement measures is carried out according to its objectives. Don't forget, as we mentioned at the beginning, you should try to get as close as possible to net zero energy to avoid locking effects. In the event that the budgetary reason is not possible to implement such measures, at least you should carry out a plan on how to make sure that happens. Below, I will share with you a list of possible improvements based on the different components of the building, starting with the envelope, improvements in the insulation, replacement of windows and frames and glass, reduction of infiltrations through doors and windows, installation of air curtains and exterior doors, parasols or canopies, capitalizing on daylight, solar shelves, among others. As for the lighting, possible improvements would be replacement of electromagnetic ballast by electric, electronic ballast and luminaires, install present detectors in areas of sporadic use, Use the natural gas by means of light sensors, lighting zoning, lighting with LED lamps, replacement of mercury or sodium vapor lamps outdoor in outdoor lighting with LEDs. Again, some of the options. As for the HVAC and AC, ACS systems, possible improvement measures proposed are install thermostatic valves in radiator, regulation of the air conditioning temperature, boiler replacement by a more efficient one, install a, bi a biomass boiler, insulation or insulation of the air conditioning distribution circuit, replacement of diesel and fuel oil by natural gas, maintenance of the boiler or any other equipment, replacement of electric um, radiators or heaters and heat with heat pumps, covering the exterior, heat recovery, install of solar thermal panels, district heating and cooling system, and lastly, installing per pearlizers on taps a very economic measure to save up to 30% of water consumption. In terms of equipment, energy demand can be reduced through use of multiple strips and programmable switch or plug, variable speed drives in motors, high efficiency engines, more efficient elevators, or any other electrical appliances. To optimize the electricity bill, possible measures can be adjustment of the contracting of the electrical supplies, 
use of computer tools for monitoring the consumption, district heating and cooling systems, among others. When it comes to generic measures, we already presented some before, but additionally, we, one can say good energy consumption practices among employees, proper maintenance of the facilities, conducting periodic energy audits, install energy management systems in buildings, obtain the energy rating of the existing building, and adaptation of the use schedule to capitalize on daylight. The final result of the step two to six is usually something like the mock-up I present in the slide to your left. With, with the current consumption based on the facilities and elements of the building, plus a proposal for improvement measures, cost estimates and savings, alongside the status of the energy certificate before and after those energy efficiency improvements. It is also important to quantify greenhouse gas emissions saved, especially in the case of municipalities. This information is the adequate and sufficient information to undertake the next step, which is seven to nine in our methodological framework. This is make a selection of improvements and measures according to the objective defined by your municipality or region, the development of an action plan for the implementation of these measures. This brings me to the last and fundamental point, which is to make a rigorous follow-up of the results. This means monitoring the results, control the consumption, and periodic monitoring of indicators. This, this task, as I mentioned earlier on, should be done in parallel to the communication of the project raising awareness on energy efficiency and, if necessary, the revision of the framework conditions to enable this. As mentioned earlier, there are more and more examples in the world of such actions. In Canada, the government is providing 1 billion Canadian currency in investment to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to retrofit buildings in the Canadian communities and improve their energy efficiency. The Federation of Canadian Municipalities advocates on behalf of over 2,000 municipalities at the national level and has a long-standing partnership with the government of Canada. In Ukraine, through the Energy Efficiency in Municipalities project, more than 50 municipalities are participating in a benchmarking system for the energy performance of the building. It comprises a data set of around 2,000 buildings, with their energy performance, allowing for a municipality to better plan and prioritize all of the retrofit activities needed. In Turkey, the urban development project is among a pioneer class of ecological restoration in urban areas and a model for the Turkish and global cities alike. Municipalities have been developing and implementing a suite of building efficiency policies and projects with priority in energy audits, job training, and public awareness raising as part of their delivery are raised. Having said that, I thank you for your attention and I will be open now for the Q&A questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Clara, for your presentation. I would like now to introduce the Q&A session. We have received uh, some very interesting questions and I would like to start with the first question. Um, Clara, uh, the first question is as follows. Where can we find the data for the building energy consumption uh, kilobytes of hour per year? So thank you, Begonia, for, for um, sharing this question. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this can be found in the energy bills, and there are several ways to collect this information. Um, one of them is through the, through the utility or the marketing manager uh, as such. They have the normally an energy man utilities have normally an energy manager available to customers with access to all the consumption and billing data for all of their buildings, and they must be able to provide this information. Another option would be um, the electronic invoices. It is a service that mostly all utilities have, and it allows to collect the invoices in a centralized way, and uh, it, you can get these annual summaries and even graphics around it. And another alternative would be to maybe in, in, in some city council department or the treasury department even. Um, the only disadvantage there, or the only drawback is that it's sometimes on the data that's collected there is sometimes uh, only referred to the, um, the, the cost and not necessarily to the energy per se. And of course the paper bills um, or the invoices, that, that should also collect um, 
the, that information. So it would be needed to collect the, the paper bills for the past year and uh, yeah, calculate that based on that. It's in that case, I think it's important to be careful because the um, invoice dates might not be or might not coincide with the reading dates. And that's something that one should check before um, collecting this data. Yeah, that would be it. Thank you so much, Clara, for your response. Another question we have received is as follows. Um, what are the ideal values in terms of kilowatt hour per square meter in municipal buildings? That's also a very good question. And as I mentioned or, or tangentially mentioned in at the beginning of the presentation, um, the values very much depend on what has been defined in different countries, regions, and municipalities. There are normally in many countries studies on what that would entail for their buildings in their context. But I would say that it should, for the electric one, it should not be more than uh, 20 kilowatt hour per square meter. Um, yeah, that should be kind of a threshold. But again, it, it's important to consult and check with uh, with um, what the framework conditions are in the different countries, the regulations, etc., related to this. Thank you so much, Clara. Another question we have received: um, What can I do if the data on the energy bills, if the information is in cubic meters or kilogram instead of kilowatt hour? Right, um, and that might very often be the case. In that case, um, so for example, in yeah, natural gas will be typically in, in cubic meters, the gas oil in, in liters, for instance, and propane, for example, kilo, kilograms. Um, there are conversion factors for that, uh, which are standardized and apply to any context. So I would uh, recommend you to check those conversion factors. And it's a very easy calculation based on, on that. Um, we can provide, if, if uh, this is a common question or if it would be helpful, we can provide with those tables. Um, but as I said, that's very easily accessible for everybody. Thank you so much, Clara, for your responses. Uh, but sadly, there's no more time to reply more questions. So ladies and gentlemen, finally, we come to the end of the webinar. I would like to say thanks to the panelists for the informative and interesting presentation and to the audience for their active participation. We hope that the presentation will be beneficial for all the stakeholders involved in energy efficiency. And thank you for your attention and wish you a good day or night from Copenhagen.